Moving on from the future of artificial intelligence to the future of computational biology, um, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker who's going to hopefully give us that link between what is happening in the brain and how can we necessarily compute that. Saul Cato is Assistant Professor of Neurology and he's head of the Foundation of Co the Cognition Laboratory at the University of California in San Francisco. He, um, Saul and his team studied the brain and the behaviour of the nematode C. elegans. Now that's not my field at all, but I believe it's an organism which feeds on microbes and he's using that to, to look for the basic principles and building blocks of neural computation and cognitive function. He has a background in lots of different fields, going from neurology, theoretical physics, maths, computer science, hardware and software, um, and he was awarded his PhD from Columbia University in 2013. He has set up, financed and sold two technology companies, um, one which uh, developed software algorithms and the other which pioneered the idea of wireless uh, content delivery. Uh, Saul and his research collaborators have deciphered that there is a tight connection between the dynamics of a brain-wide activity in these elegans and um, the behaviour that they also display. And his work on this little creature continues, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about it. So please welcome Saul Cato. Um, Murray and I were having a laugh at dinner last night <clears throat> that uh, a side effect of the AI explosion is that uh, related niche fields like computational neuroscience uh, has now become uh, an actual means of gainful employment. I'm going to jump in here. Consider this beast um, responsible for more deaths than all of the great animals of the African savanna combined. Uh, but as a scientist, uh, maybe in the 17th, 18th century, as soon as microscopes were, were available, you might have gotten excited about this creature because under the microscope it moves quite well. And movement, maybe uh, if you're interested in, in defining life, um, might be a signature of life. And um, if we stare at these animals for a while, we notice they move quite well. Um, and they move in a, in a particular way. And if we keep looking carefully, maybe with a, a, a a higher magnification microscope, um, we notice that you know, it has flagella, it has these, these threads coming out of the back that seem to propel the animal forward quite efficiently. So we might ask, how does this, how does this work? Um, and we might think a little more and, and look a little more and realize that the flagella seem to be rotating in a coherent bundle and providing thrust, uh, much like uh, you, you know, an, a, 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 the propeller of a ship. Uh, and you might suspect that something is going on to make this thing rotate, but we have no idea how something would rotate uh, on the surface uh, of, of a cell. So if we look even closer, um, we see something fantastic. We see a tiny micro-machine, a molecular machine, um, that essentially, by looking at, uh, at it, tells you the whole story. Um, this is a, an electron microscopy, time-average microscopy image of of the element connecting the flagella to the membrane. And as, as I think anyone who's um, been in a car might notice, uh, this, this is a motor. Uh, and uh, as Ada told you, the, the field now of structural biology has is, is sort of been reinvigorated uh, because of, of some new developments. This is a, a, re, a more recent cryo-EM image of the same um, beautiful molecular machine. <laughs> and um, Richard Feynman, the physicist, uh, dabbled a bit in biology and, and got really excited and said, you know, in biology, uh, you, you just have to look at it to understand it. And he, he, he didn't mean to be derogatory. Although I think a lot of biologists took, took offense at that it's not an easy field. Um, but, you know, he's right in this sense, uh, at least for certain things, that if you can get the molecular structure, structure defines function at the microscopic level. And, and you're done. And in fact, you know, you can go ahead and label everything in, that you can see with, with uh, once you've got a beautiful image like this, and you can see all of the elements of a conventional motor that are replicated on the nanoscale. You see a rotor, um, you see uh, the moving part, you see the stator, which is the, the element that delivers energy that doesn't move, um, and, and it's all there for your understanding. And there's another molecule um, that sort of has yielded great insight by, by way of its structure. Um, and you've seen this diagram before. Um, but, you know, 
DNA had been suspected, nucleic acids had been suspected to be the carrier of heritability for a long time, uh, but the structure really yielded the understanding that here is a way that this quasi-crystal, this linear polymer floating in liquid can actually do this. And it really led to the first, let's say, big data explosion, which was that you know, there is a, a code script, as it was called, or code now, as we say, um, that holds a ton of information in every cell, in, in every uh, animal, uh, and every cell of your body. And in 1952, we weren't so good at, 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 at sequencing this out, but by the end of the Human Genome Project, well, it's still ongoing, according to some, but we became very good, and we could sequence 3.3 uh, billion base pairs, just under a gigabyte of, of uncompressed data, if you, if you want to carry it around on your computer. And this, this was the, the dawn of, of big data. And suddenly, we have something that we can't just look at. And, and so when I was asked to, to, to come give this talk, I, I had to look up what computational biology was. Um, and so I, <laughs> I consulted the oracle of all human knowledge, which is, is Wikipedia. Uh, and Wikipedia says, computational biology is the science of using biological data to develop algorithms or models to understand biological systems and relationships. Um, for me, it's just how do we understand bio biological systems when you just can't look at it? I mean, we don't have easy, easy to understand, easy to intuit pictures. What, what we instead have is a whole ton of data. And um, I think this is, is obvious to, to everyone in this room. And I say excessive because the understanding hasn't necessarily come yet. We're hoping that having this, this massive pool of data, genomic and others, and I'll talk briefly about what kinds of data there is, um, should lead eventually to understanding. Um, and it's not just this is a log of kind of a infographic uh, of the logarithmic explosion of, uh, exponential explosion rather, plotted on a log logarithmic graph of both base pairs and sequences that are stored in gene bank. But it's not just genomics, it's epigenomics, the tags and the ways of controlling which genes get turned on and off that we can now sequence out, we can get um, the RNA transcripts that are coming out of the DNA, and, from, and this is a huge exploding way of keeping biologists employed today. Um, proteomics, the proteins, the, the, the makeup of the proteins in the body, and metabolomics, all of the other, in, in addition to the proteins, all of the other molecules that are keeping you, all your cells healthy. And then finally, connectomics, which is sort of the mapping out of the, the detailed structure of, of the cells in your brain, generally your brain, or it could, could be in other places. Um, to try to understand how things work. So we have not just a lot of data, but a lot of moda data modalities. And um, this sort of brings us back to one of the original conceptions of, of how to do science. Uh, this is Francis Bacon was the sort of the launched the idea of empiricism, or it was just maybe the, the, the flag in the ground for the world. Um, and the idea was that to understand the world, we just have to collect data and then um, by induction, we will sort of distill down the laws of the universe. And it took 300 years before, um, you know, Karl Popper came and, and sort of really articulated the hypothetical deductive procedure that is sort of the dominant way of, that we talk about science now, make a hypothesis, try to falsify it. Um, and right now, I would say the pendulum is swinging back to the Baconian method, which is this hope that we can just collect data, that we can just sort of put our heads down and, and gather enough data and maybe put it through a nice... A deep learning machine or other AI device, and you know, out will pop, you know, the the, the next set of, of laws of the universe. And I, I'm, you know, I'm optimistic about the utility of the data. I'm not. I still am, am, am pretty pretty sure we need to have hypotheses. So, um, so, you know, we'd like understanding to come out of this. But what do we do in the meantime? Well, we wait around for Karl Popper's sort of magical moment of of, of a hypothesis entering our brain or or or, or, a, th or a theory. Well, we, we can try to extract structure out of the data, and that's what a lot of uh, computational biology is about. So what's the first thing we can do when we have a lot of data? We can try to extract structure about the relationships, as Danny Bassett said, the relationships between the units uh, of our data. And so this is um, a, a, a giant cloud of genes in an, a, a, a mic microbe that is radiation uh, resistant, and the blue genes are unique to this animal. And what you should take away from this is that there are a lot of genes, and they have relationships, and I'm not sure what else you're going to take away from it. Um, here's another hard-to-see um, giant 
set of relationships of the E. coli metabolic network. It has a little more apparent structure. If you look, if you could see here, there's a circle here and a circle here. There's this Krebs cycle and the citric acid cycle. It's embedded in a whole giant network of, me of metabolic reactions. Somehow all of this comes together in a system sense to produce a healthy cell or, or an unhealthy cell, it's, um, depending on the context. Um, but you know, you can carry this sort of exercise almost ad infinitum. Uh, where you can gather up all of the, I just you know, saw this publication, it was the, the Google of um, metabolic reactions. Every, every, every metabolic reaction that's been published in a paper um, put together in um, a nice infographic that you can print out. Um, and again, I'm not sure what insight this is providing other than everything is connected. Maybe, it, maybe it's a map for discovery, maybe it's uh, a way to hone in on um, you know, disease-related phenomena. If, if I'm, I can be an empiricist without being a scientist, without being after a deep understanding, that's totally fine. Um, but, I, but I am after deep understanding, and so um, I'm going to take a pause here and talk about another type of big data that, that actually has been around for a long time. Um, and Sidney Brenner was a, about a 26-year-old grad student around, uh, had, who was in Cambridge, joined the group uh, that had you know, discovered DNA or characterized it, and, um, and, and thought, well, the, the problem is all of the great molecular biology questions have been answered, so um, I want to go do something on, on the next level. Now, I think he was wrong about that, and he, he'd admit to, admit to that, but he did kick off, starting in about 1965, uh, a wonderful program of trying to understand a whole organism and how, it, how a whole organism is, develops, and how it's, it's sort of decompressed out of its genome and produces a wonderful, competent animal that can react to its environment and produce all the sort of af affectations of, an, of a living being. And he really kicked off a worldwide effort that's been going on uh, for decades now to understand this animal. And one of the things he did was say, well, let's just characterize the entire structure of the animal. Let's take advantage of a new technique, electron microscopy, and we'll, we'll, we'll do uh, what, what big data used to mean, which is hiring lots of people to slice up very fine microscopy images and then trace, trace little circles around all of these pro fine processes. And what you get after doing this for literally 20 years is in 1986 a full connectome of the animal. So this is a graph representing all of the circuit connections between all of the neurons colored by the type of neuron in the animal. And now it's 2018, and we've stared at this diagram for 30 years, and we haven't made much of it. Um, you know, we use it, it guides us for hypothesis making, but, but we can't sort, just sort of run it and say, go, this is here, ergo the animal. Um, and, and so we want to know why. Um, here's, a, here's you can also, you can continue this process. Connectomics is a big endeavor, and people are applying this to, at the micro scale in, in, in mammals and humans. And they're also trying to do macro scale um, connect, connectomics. Again, this is a pretty picture, but I'm, I'm, I'm st still trying to wonder how do we get to the next step? And that, that's, I think, the field is wondering how do we take this to the next step of understanding? So I think one thing that we may have lost in this, uh, this large effort, and of course, many scientists are quite aware of this, I don't want to say that the field is blind, but we have put our heads down for a while to collect the data, and I think it's time to now come up and reaffirm the basics of, of the field. And what, what makes biology special and different vis-a-vis -vis other sciences, other basic sciences? And the answer is something that has become a bad word. One part, half of the answer is, is, that, is that biology is about elements or things we study that we, we, we assume to have a function. Uh, and this, the, the, word, the bad word is teleology. And it kind of went away with, with evolution because people said, well, hold on, things don't have an intrinsic purpose. There's, there's no will in this in this single-celled animal. Clearly, it's, it's just parts, it's just physics, um, and it's evolution that has sort of created this, this false sense that there's a will. And so Ernst Meyer proposed a, a modification of the word um, because we still, as biologists, use this functional intuition to, to, to go after things. We believe everything has a purpose. If something you shake in a system and something falls out, you, you think that's a screw and you think that screw had a purpose, and that, that holds true for biological studies. Otherwise, we're just sort of chasing tea leaves. Um, but the word he proposed was teleonomy. So if you want to talk about function now, talk about teleonomy. No one will, no one will think that you're a creationist. Um, the other part, though, is that, that biological systems are dynamical. So depending on, you know, networks look, these diagrams look static, but everything that goes on in biology is about a real-time input and output to the system. Right? Animals have to be responsive at all times. Cells have to be responsive at all times. 
And so we need to bring that into, into our, as, as Danny mentioned, we need to bring dynamics into, into our, our picture of, of complicated structures and, comp and, and, and systems. And so this framework has been around a long time. It actually began with the cybernetics movement, which was contemporary of Schrodinger, Schrodinger's era of musing about how to sort of break down biology. Um, and it's the idea of a, of a system with an input and an output and elements inside. And it's, 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 it's pretty much that simple. Um, but the utility of this is that we can mathematize you know, the, the procedure. We can write the input down as a time series. We write the output down as a time series. And we can write down the activity of a whole bunch of internal state variables or elements as a time series. And, and then we just need a set of equations that describe the, the time evolution of all of our internal state variables. And in theory, we have a full model. Now, these are hard, and we have to get the right equations. And that's the key. And that's the missing piece of a network diagram. So um, that being said, that can, this model can be applied to a cell. It can be applied to an organ. It can be applied to an organism. And so has this worked in the past? Well, it has worked. It's worked with our friend E. coli. You know it's worked because, and you know understanding is real, because um, uh, there's a marketing diagram that um, a reagent company will sell you. That means it's truth. And um, you just have to write down a couple equations of the internal state variables, and you really capture the, individual, the behavior of an individual cell. Now, there's much to be figured out with E. coli, but this is sufficient understanding for me to go to bed at night and not worry about E. coli. Um, another great success, of course, arguably the greatest success of computational neuroscience was to figure out how uh, a, a neuron uh, spikes and how an input of a step of current causes this beautiful set of action potentials. And I just want to point this out because this happened back in 1952. And the way, even 10 years later, to, to actually test your model was you didn't get to write a, a code script in your, in your laptop machine and have run a simulation. You actually had to build a circuit. So we have it pretty easy today. Here's a third success of the input-output system. This is a little bit of a cheat, obviously, because the reason we understand this much more complex 1,500-gate system is that we built it. Um, but maybe there are principles that we can learn from this input-output system that we can ask whether they exist in biology. So for example, modularity plays heavily. The reuse of a set of very consistent uh, low-level units of gates plays heavily. Um, we're, we look for these things. We look for hierarchy. We look for modularity in our, in our systems. Um, but I'm going to tell you about the efforts to try to understand a multicellular organism, to which we currently have, have no really good understanding. Um, and so this is, I've redrawn that, that network diagram that I showed you of the worm. It's got input, it's got a bunch of processing units, and it's got output. And the output in this case is organismal level, so it's, we, we watch these animals, we record their behavior, we quantify them, we watch that it has the ability to crawl forward. Um, it will soon shortly pause, it has a very beautiful ability to reverse, it has the ability to turn. So at the simplest level, we can write down that as a sequence of behavioral output, and that becomes our output. And we may ask, how does this, this, this system produce that? And to do that, we want to get into the brain. So here's a rendering of, um, of, this, of the, the, the nervous system of the animal, 302 neurons. So it's a big number, but it's not necessarily a crushingly imposing number, like 80 billion of the human brain. And we go into the, into the, to the head ganglia. This is where most, the nerve ring, where most of the nerves are, and this is the technique that we use, and we use some of the, the earlier uh, technologies that, that Carl mentioned, which is bringing, genetically introducing an, um, an indicator, a molecule that can detect the activity of, of every cell, and we get a beautiful recording, beautiful to me anyway, of every cell in, the, in this animal's brain act, active. And using some machine learning techniques and uh, machine vision, we can extract that activity, into a raster plot. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but you see a wonderful structure, and you see it across every neuron. You see a brain-wide pattern. And we wondered, what is this brain-wide pattern? And it turns out, if you distill down the top three dimensions of this high-dimensional time series, and you plot that against each other, you get a trajectory that has order and structure, but variability. It is vaguely reminiscent of the structure that people, if you've ever read James Gleick's Chaos, of the Lorentz attractor, but a system that's chaotic, capable of sort of variable behavior, but, but being, being able to maintain multiple stable states. And this, this analogy is not to suggest that this is a chaotic attractor, but only to suggest that there is both structure and variability, which is the hallmark of a, a cognitive system. 
And it turns out that where you are in this abstract space, this is one long string of spaghetti taken from one recording. This brain state goes through a number of different areas. And where you are in state space determines actually the animal's intent, whether it's trying to go forward or backward or turn left or turn right. We can see that if we rotate that same plot, um, we're just looking at two, again, abstract dimensions. And we see that the colors correspond specifically to the kinds of moves that you see the animal execute on a plate. So we've connected behavior output to internal state to some low-dimensional brain-wide state, and that actually is quite different than the architecture that you see in a computer. You wouldn't see the same kind of brain or computer-wide signal if you started to do this on a chip. Um, but we're able to extract a topology uh, out of the brain state that represents the behavioral topology. So we think we're, we're making progress, and the next steps in this research are to, to use other techniques to perturb the system and, and really understand how so, for example, decisions are made to go down one branch or the other, which is you know, underlying the, the, the sort of the fundamental idea of action selection, choosing between two options as an organism. This approach of dynamics, of, of studying the dynamics of a system, has, has, is, is not limited to neuroscience. Um, this is a, just came out a few weeks ago, this, this publication, um, using single-cell RNA. So this is now taking one of these high-throughput, th high big-data approaches, um, and in doing it not just across in, in bulk across an animal or across a system, but for every, every cell, which you used using some fancy technology, um, uh, microfluidics and, and, other, and other really cool innovations. And we can map out um, by doing this, and this is an another abstract low-dimensional space, um, but we can map out just by the position of, in this space the identities of all the neurons in this case of, I think this is a hippocampus, this is mouse hippocampus, I believe. Um, and this is the basic insight that if you can just separate these cells, you can classify them into types. But the cool thing is if you track velocity, which is sort of the first dynamical variable, and you draw a velocity vector at, on every cell, again, each of these dots is a cell that's been colored by its, its cell identity, you see that um, there's a trajectory. And this trajectory defines, actually here, you see a small inset, this is the diagram of the cell development, the cell differentiation path. So suddenly, by tracking velocities, we got a lot more than just static cell identity. We got a, the whole time history, the, whole, the way that a system controls its development. So I think this is a, a, a really profound, uh, I mean, you know, biologists discovered physics here. But I mean, you can see that, that we're, we're making strides in understanding how systems are actually controlling and producing very diverse and rich phenotypes. So, um, so what is the future of computational biology? I can tell you for sure it's one thing. It's more data. Um, <laughs> not just because of the, the, the need to stay employed. Um, you know, <laughs> I mentioned that we're expanding wildly along the t-axis. Now, there's also studying more organisms and, um, and also spatializing these kinds of measurements, going through different areas of an organism or uh, of an organ. But I think picking up time series and figuring out smart ways of acquiring all of this kind of data as an organism develops or as it moves through its, its world, this is really going to change our understanding of how a living system, a living computational system works. And so now the more controversial answer to um, what is the future of computational biology and I think the future of computational biology is understanding biological computation. And I, what I mean by that is reframing the question, understanding that we're not just looking at systems that are complex, but they're systems that have an input and output and a function, and bringing that back into, into, our, into our approaches to try to build models and try to build theories. And we're going to look for um, you know, answers that, well, you know, we, we shouldn't be too daunted by a billion or 80 billion, because we already know how a billion transistor CPU works. Of course, we built it. Um, and perhaps some of the principles of hierarchy and organization and abstraction and software, perhaps we'll find analogies in biology and perhaps we won't. Um, but we want to turn eventually to systems like this, which is a 3D cerebral organoid, tish, st stem cell derived piece of human brain tissue. We've used the same tricks to get electrical activity converted into something that we can read out with a microscope, and we see beautiful patterns of both global and local activity, and, you know, the game is on. Thank you.